What is going on? Welcome back to another episode of It's a Blast podcast. My name's Mike, also known as the EOD Happy Captain on X, formerly known as Twitter. Today, I'm sitting down with Andy, a soldier assigned to the Sergeant's Major Academy at Fort Bliss, Texas. Today, we're going to talk about his leadership style. So let's get started. Welcome to the It's a Blast podcast. My name's Mike. Here, we talk to members of the veteran community and those currently serving about how the military has shaped their lives. Before we get started today, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to listen or watch. I'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe and follow to this podcast. What is going on? Right now I'm sitting down with Andy. You may know him as the MedPro Center of Excellence on Twitter. Been trying to get him to come onto the show for a little bit. Andy, what is going on? How are you doing? Good. What's going on, Mike? I'm just living my best life. Why don't you tell uh, people a little bit about yourself, what they should know about you? Like, how did you join the military? How old were you when you start? Okay, um, I'm going to take you way back, uh, pre-9-11. Uh, I was 17 years old, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. No real plan forward, uh, just just kind of existing. Uh, recruiter actually cold called, and uh, I was like, sure, let's, let's just see what happens. Come talk. Uh, came over, we did a little testing, and uh, I thought, hey, let's do a skill the army has plenty of jobs that provide skills after, you know, after service. So I thought I'd be a truck driver. And, uh, 2000, I delayed entry program, went to uh, Fort Leonard Wood for summer of 2001, uh, post-graduation high school, uh, was in AIT during 9-11. So uh, with the global war on terror ending in 2022, uh, my entire time in the army has been at war. Um, I stayed in the reserves for a little bit, uh, around 07, came back from, I'm sorry, uh, 05, came back from my second tour uh, in Iraq and I really had trouble. I had some PTSD issues. Uh, I had trouble holding down a job. Uh, so I turned to, uh, the second family, you know, the army about coming on active duty, uh, getting my feet settled and, you know, trying to be an adult in the world. So uh, 2000, 2006, I went on active duty uh, and stationed at the great uh, then Fort Hood, now Fort Cavazos, uh, the good old great place. Uh, and then uh, really just stuck around the Army because I like the people. Um, it's a hey. people organization. It's a people business. And hey. go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and you're currently at the Sergeant Majors Academy, right? So obviously it's been a very successful career. Uh, Successful enough. Um, I never thought I would be, uh, I I switched MOSs to 80 November along the way. And uh, it's been a great experience being at 88 November. Uh, It's a a stellar job. It's got great benefits outside the military. Um, But the promotion rates weren't always what we had hoped. You know, they don't tell you that part when you switch MOS is about longevity in the army necessarily. So I never thought I'd make Sergeant first class. I never thought I'd make master Sergeant and I surely had never thought I'd make the Sergeant majors Academy. Uh, so at this point it's just fun and I'm doing it because I love the organization. I, I do love the people. Um, I do miss being a leader uh, currently as a student. Uh, I get to worry about me and my education. So uh, there's some benefits to that, but I do miss leading soldiers at the time. Yeah, absolutely. So let's back up though, because what I think every recruiter who's listening or watching heard is that cold calls work, right? (laughs) Um, But, you know, you said you were in AIT during 9-11. So, you know, let's talk about that a little bit, because obviously, you know, you got a call from a recruiter. You said, why not? I'm going to join the army. You know, I'm a, um, I'm going to assume that not being at war had some calculus in that decision. And so you're at AIT, 9-11 happened. You know, what, what goes through your mind knowing that the country is about to go to war? So they called us all in from the pad. They sent us to the room, the day room. And they said, go into the day room and turn on the TV. And we're like, we're not falling for that trap. Like We, we haven't been allowed to use that room the whole time. Uh, some explicit words were said and we went in the room. Uh, 
Joe Sarnes walked in, said, very, very matter of fact, congratulations. Uh, we are now at war. When you leave here, you will be going to war. And they left it at that. Um, let it sink in a little bit. Uh, I never really, I don't think the aspect of war actually settled into my head uh, till I was standing in the middle of Baghdad at the Cross Sabres in the spring of 2003. Uh, the running joke in our organization was that they actually flew us to NTC and just didn't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it just kind of sinks in at that moment. You see the Sabres, the stuff that we saw as kids uh, during the Gulf War, right? Um, and that was my oh shit moment. Like, this is this is the real thing. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And I think, you know, for me it was, so I was in EOD school, you know, obviously the war had been going on, but it was 2010. And so my first sergeant at EOD school kind of pulled me aside because I'd made some comments about, hey, I really want to go deploy. Uh, and he said, hey, you know, I'll reach out to you in a couple of months. And like, I'm a, I'm a private, right? So I'm thinking like, oh, okay, you know, that'll never happen. And so I'm uh, getting ready to graduate EOD school and I get a phone number or, you know, I get a phone call from a number I don't recognize. And it was my EOD school first sergeant who had moved up to Fort Campbell and he remembered me and he was like, Hey, do you still want to deploy? And I'm like, yes, absolutely. And he said, don't take any leave after EOD school, come right to Campbell. And no joke. I was in Afghanistan three weeks after I graduated EOD school. Didn't know anything. Uh, my team leader kept me alive for the first couple of months. So they figured out that, you know, I wasn't a complete fool, yeah. but like, you know, one of the jokes that I make here at EOD school is we are training on inert items, right? Nothing here is going to hurt anybody. It's all training. Uh, and so like you're playing with explosives in school not thinking about like the real world repercussions. I remember getting to Afghanistan and working on real devices and being like, it took me a second to realize, Hey, I'm in Afghanistan. Like this could kill me, yeah. you know? And so like, I, I think everybody has that moment of clarity where like it snaps back into focus yeah. and you're like, well, here I am. Right. Like, um, I remember you go to the range, you shoot 50 cows, you shoot two forties. Right. But it's just shooting at the range. Uh, the reality setting in of when you were defending yourself uh, against other humans, right? That it's a different mindset. Um, and that's something that's stuck with me throughout my career is while you might be a truck driver, you might be an EOD person, right? Your actual job is to engage the enemy and kill them if need be, right? Um, yeah, hundred percent. Specialties are secondary to that first job. And as long as you were okay with that, you know, Welcome to the team. And so you had said, you know, during your introduction that, you know, you came back from your deployment and you had some trouble reintegrating back into civilian life, right? Some PTSD. I think, you know, most people have deployed have, have experienced something that fundamentally alters them, right? And so looking at where behavioral health is now versus where it was then, you know, have you seen benefits in the way that we broadcast to the force that, hey, behavioral health are okay and things like that of that nature? I want to say that the stigma is gone, uh, but it's still there. I mean, we'll just be honest. Uh, there's more senior leaders uh, that think they're going to deal with it like we dealt with it for years of not getting help, not seeking treatment. And as I do my and my quarterly reminders, my annual reminders to go to behavioral health and fix your issues because no one's going to fix them for you, right? You have to be able to seek help. And I hope yeah. that our generation's coming up, right? As we become the more senior leaders, that stigma gets erased more and more as we promote through the ranks. No, I 100% agree. And one of the reasons I want to talk about that is you make a lot of comments on X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, about taking care of yourself about making those comments. Hey, this is your quarterly reminder that if you don't go see behavioral health, like you are responsible for taking care of you, but isn't it indicative of the way we progress that we have senior leaders on social media saying that stuff? Uh, there's a cutoff of, I think, effectiveness, right? Uh, uh, general officer saying it carries a certain level of importance Whereas someone that takes care of the individual children on a daily basis, right? That might resonate a little bit more. Um, it might have a little more impact while 
I might not be as respected on X or Twitter as this, uh, you know, some of those general officer big accounts. Uh, I see the impacts that a positive relationship with their behavioral health has. And it's something that I wish I had taken seriously years prior. Uh, the joke with my mom is uh, when I told her I went and got help, she said, thank God we've known you've been messed up for years. Yeah. And I said, were you not going to say something right like that? Your own parents just don't understand how to go get help because it's a different world. And that's why I say it's on you to get that help, seek that help. But it's on us as leaders to promote that environment that makes that reciprocal relationship work. No, I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think after my first deployment, you know, I, I went through the same thing a lot of other people went through where it was, I don't need help. I am fine. I can handle all this stuff on my own. Um, you know, I have uh, a really good mentor, uh, you know, he's a sergeant major, but he constantly says, are you surviving or are you thriving? Right. Because everybody can wake up in the morning and go to work and they, you know, put on their uniform and a lot of them do great work when they go to work. Right. But then they come home and, you know, they're in their castles, right. They, they don't interact in public. They don't, they don't live their lives. Right. Yeah. And so for me, one of the big things about seeking behavioral health help was, you know, it's made me a better soldier. It's made me a better father. It's made me a better husband uh, because, you know, like I, I'm out of my shell more, like I'm willing to get out and, and go do more stuff. Now, obviously I still have my days where like, you know, today we're wearing sweatpants and, and we're going to sit here and we're going to watch TV. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, but I think it's important that there's people like you who, you know, you're at the Sergeant's major Academy, you're going to be a Sergeant major. People are going to look up to you. It is right. I mean, like when did we become the adults, but there's, there's people in the room that are looking to you to say, you know, well, if, if Sergeant Major can do it, why can't I do it? Right. And then if you're willing to protect that space saying, hey, specialist so-and-so has an appointment today, we're going to leave them alone. That empowers them to go do that. And I think you talk about being the example, right? Setting the conditions. And that's kind of why I'm the way I am on social media, right? The, the physical fitness is important. Behavior health is important. Those are all things that are geared towards the longevity of you, whether or not you're in the uniform, right? Like those are Mike 40 years from now is going to be benefited from the self care that they do right now in this environment. And no, I, I, mean I personally thank my wife um, for pushing me like realistically, she gave me an ultimatum because I was uh, came back uh, tour number four, four I think uh, three or four. Uh, and <laughs> when I, I left, when my oldest son was six months, and I came home when I was when he was eighteen months, and I went from having this baby to having a little human, and I felt as a failure as a parent. I felt failure as an NCO because I couldn't take care of myself. Uh, and my wife just sat me down. I was like, get your shit together. Yeah. It was just play. It's she was just like, if you don't, we're out. And boom. Right. What's important to you is now important to me. And we're going to adjust and I'm going to take care of some shit. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of went through a similar, similar thing where I went, you know, I deployed to Kosovo. My kid was three months old. I came back. He was a year old. So not quite as long as yours, but same concept, right? You leave and they're just like a little bundle of like, like they're just like a little meatball. Right. And yeah. then you come back and they have a personality. Right. And you know, for me, it was my kid looked at me when I came back and like, he didn't know who I was. Right. And so like, you know, I deployed, I missed his first steps. I came back, you know, we tried to FaceTime because it's just a different operating environment. That was, that was, we were able to do that. Um, but I came back and my kid for like the first three weeks, wanted nothing to do with me. Correct. Right. Because I was a stranger in the house. That's like a really like surreal feeling, you know, because the entire time you're gone, you can't wait to get home. Then you get home and this little human has no idea who you are. Right. right. Now, uh, 
I did some adjustments, right? Me and my kid have a great relationship and like he loves being around me. I love being around him. So it's awesome and it worked out. But like that wasn't something I was expecting to happen because it's not something we normally think about, you know? No, um, not at all. And, and so, think... you know, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, you talk a lot about being present on social media. And I think having these hard conversations in that form allows people to see that there are leaders out there that are the same as them, right? I mean, every single soldier has issues, right? They just think their issues are unique to them. They don't realize that their senior leaders have gone through the same stuff. So having that openness with them makes you more approachable. Um, right. you know, and that's the key to, I think that's the key to being an effective leader is being transparent. Uh, when I grew, when I was coming through the ranks, all my NCOs never, they never, not that they never faltered because some of them weren't the greatest, but they had the, I have no cracks in my armor. I'm an NCO. I don't need support. I don't, I don't need any help. And not looking back, that's just not true, right? Like everyone was going through stuff and then, then the height of GWAT. Um, to say that you weren't, I think you're lying to yourself. And I wanted to be on par with my soldiers. Like I didn't want to be the first sergeant that was talking down to soldiers. I wanted to be the first that was talking to my soldiers. Um, there's a clear delineation of, I see what you're going through. Here's some things that I went through. Here's some things that I did. May or may not work. Try them out. We'll go from there. See what happens, right? It means you're engaged, yeah. right? I mean, you know, and, and you do a fantastic job, you know, on X about posting about that stuff. And so in, in a space where it seems that we have less and less senior leader engagement on there, um, you know, what do you think the benefit of being in that space is? So I, I would like to be a little more deliberate when you talk about Army senior leaders and senior leaders, right? There's, right. There's, there's a prescribed definition of Army senior leaders, and then there's just us old people, right, that are just senior leaders. Um, so Fair. I think <laughs> the, <laughs> the uh, absence of senior leaders, I think, is a detraction from educating the younger parts of the force that really are they spend the majority of their lives and their time on social media, whatever platform it may be, right? Uh, X, uh, TikTok, Instagram, right? They're on there. That's a great way to be engaged. I'm not saying you should be following your soldiers or they should be following you. Uh, but it's provided me an avenue for the population that has day-to-day -day problems that could just DM me, ask me about how to proceed with an Article 15 what they should do for an NCO, what they should do for a soldier that's not really doing what they're supposed to be doing. Just different ways to give like day-to-day -day advice. And I think that's paid off in the long run. I'm bit by bit putting some of my philosophy out there for each individual to kind of spread amongst their own people. Uh, I am followed by several of my old soldiers from Germany. And uh, I, I'd like that they're on there because one, I can still keep in contact with them. I could go to Christensen's wedding, which I did, which was great. Right. Um, and then, but I can also continue to mentor and guide them as they go through the ranks. So it's just a double edged sword that I think has benefits, but with trolls, um, people that might be from a different ideology than you, right. Uh, a different spectrum, if you will, that uh, might not agree with everything that you say, you just have to be, cautious with how you proceed on certain things because not everyone sees things the way you do. No, I think, I think that's 100% fair. I mean, in a generation, you kind of touched on it, right? Uh, social media is the water cooler for this next generation, right? They are on TikTok, They are on Instagram. Um, maybe they're on threads. I don't know. That one seemed to kind of fall apart really quick. Yeah. Uh, but you know, they're there, right. And they are looking at what people are doing. They're looking at what their leaders are doing. I mean, we have a lot of great presence, you know, um, mandatory fun day, Lord ellipse, you know, on Instagram. And so seeing that again, 
these people, right, that wear the uniform are just that they are people. You know, I was I was talking to you before we started recording and we we're going through some of uh, the quotes that you've picked up, uh, you know, in your time in leadership. And so I want to read a couple of them and kind of figure out where they came from. I agree with, you know, uh, if you don't want the responsibilities of a leader, then don't be one. Like, that's awesome, right? Uh, well, technically is not a defense for your actions or in actions as a leader. Perfect, right? I have more faith in your abilities than you, and that's a problem. I like that one a lot. Right. So let's talk about that for a second when we talk about, you know, soldiers who doubt themselves. Right. But you see it as a leader, how good they are. So um, that that one in particular came from a soldier of mine that had just got to the unit, was really wanting to do good things. And he got a DUI sitting in the parking lot smoking a cigarette. Uh, He just happened to be sitting in his car and. I didn't know enough about him, right? I've, I've, I've crossed that Gomar off my list years ago, right? So people saw faith in me to stay in the army. I'm going to go to bat for you, see what happens. Um, but while he was through that process, I put him in my training room because I wanted to make him uncomfortable, right? 88 mics typically don't like computers. They don't like staff work. They don't like that, you know, admin type positions. Um, but he was a solid kid and he had, talked to me about how he was wanting to turn his life around and he wanted to uh, be an adult and be, you know, a good NCO in the army in the future. I was like, okay, well, you want to be a good NCO? That's taking care of soldiers. I'm going to put you in a training room because you're going to take care of all the soldiers. Uh, And he absolutely hated his life trying to work DTMS. Uh, A company of 270 is a large beast. And he was doing good stuff and you could see that the heart was there. The desire was there. He wanted to do good by his own name, his own soldiers. And it just clicked on me. Like I see what you have to bring to the table, even though you're doubting yourself, I promise you, you can do it. I should not have more faith in your abilities than you. And I say that also silently freaking out about how I'm supposed to be the adult in the room as a future Sergeant major. Right. Um, so those isms like that one are, you know, they, they serve a purpose for me as well. Right. Those are, those are things I go back to, to, you know, make sure that I'm still walking the line of who I want to be as a leader and who I want my subordinates to be as leaders. So you are at the Sergeant's major Academy, uh, got, got two real questions coming out of there. The first is, have they issued you, your pet peeve yet? Is it going to be walking on the grass? What's it going to be? Um, I think we get our pet peeves uh, the final week after academic ends. I haven't been told yet. Um, walking on the grass will not be it. There have been several enthusiastic conversations about walking on grass between students and cadre here. Uh, the generational difference, if you will, is the older Old head sergeant majors seem to think that that is a indicative of a characteristic of your personality, your work ethic, right? Uh, or the younger generation thinks that I just found a more effective way to get from point A to point B. And it's a it's been a point of contention between some of us. Uh, I mean, I, I believe it. I feel like grass is protected on Fort Bliss because there's so little of it out there. Um, but, you know, all, all joking aside, being at the SAR Major Academy, um, you know, you're getting ready. I think you're going, what, uh, fourth ID to Fort Carson, correct? Yeah. Going back to so, Carson. you know, what? what is your hope for being at that level and operating at that level? You know, obviously the Army has said you're going to be a Sergeant Major. Hopefully that means at some point you will be a battalion and, you know, maybe even a brigade Sergeant Major. And so what is it that you want to – you know, bring to the table in your leadership style with younger soldiers at that level of formation, at that scale? So I'll be going to a staff position right out of the gate. Right. Um, so as a transportation sergeant major, I will be 
trying to make the brigade's life easier as they go to NTC, JRTC rotations, right? My, my job is going to focus on trying to streamline processes so that we can afford soldiers as much time as possible before they have to go do Army stuff. Whether or not you have a family, if I can give you an extra weekend in the barracks out in Colorado Springs with your wife and kid, your husband and kid, um, rather than doing railhead operations, I'm going to try and do that every day. Um, but as I transition to the sergeant major of battalion, potentially uh, brigade, I don't know. That's a, that's a it's way up here. So uh, we'll focus on that 50 meter target first. Um, but as a as a battalion sergeant major, and I think you've seen me say it on on Twitter on, on X is. Shared leadership is a responsibility of everyone. And you as a company commander, right? You have, you have staff, you have subordinates. If right. they are consistently fighting you, the boat doesn't row as fast, right? The, yes. It, it's a team effort. And, and I personally think that a single point of uh, a single focal po- point, such as a SAR major or commander, isn't what makes an organization great. It's the subordinates and the team aspect that makes any subordinate, any organization great. Uh, there was never me or the commander or you and your first sergeant running everything that that company is responsible for. The subordinates are responsible for how that works. You're just there to guide, right? You're not there to necessarily have to execute everything that you put forth. That's what they're there for, right? It's a team effort. Uh, and I think as a battalion sergeant major, especially if it was to be somewhere like Fort Carson or Fort Inspector Division, you know, they're everywhere all the time. Uh, my my main focus would be to get the lowest level soldiers to understand that their piece in the pie has a, a cascading effect on the bigger picture. That way, they understand their piece. They're more motivated. They understand that they're you know how they fit into that piece affects the larger scheme and we can all do a better job. So you're talking about empowering subordinates, right? Which I absolutely love. I dig it. Right. Um, I've seen specialists with more clout and and leadership. I'm sorry. I'll put this as leadership capital in an organization than any leader in a leadership billet. Yeah, no, I'm not. A hundred percent. Right. I mean, you know, if you empower your subordinates, then like they will do the hard work when no one's looking. Right. If it's not prescriptive leadership where they only do exactly what you tell them to do, if you empower them to make decisions, then at the end of the day, they will do the hard work for you. No, I think that's, I think that's awesome. Listen, if, if, uh, you know, if you're looking for a captain in your battalion, let me know. Uh, that sounds like some leadership philosophy that I can 100% get behind. And I think most people listening to this could get behind as well. Um, hey, Andy, I want to say thank you for, you know, taking the time out of your weekend to come here, be on this show with me for kind of sharing your leadership philosophy. For the people that are listening, how can they find you on Twitter? Uh, so I am on Twitter at the MedPro Center of Excellence. Uh, I believe my at name is assistant to the regional manager. So perfect. Uh, very serious, very serious people, very serious titles. Um, that's where I'm at. I don't have any other social media besides Facebook, which is, you know, family photos and adventures around the world. Uh, centric. It was great coming on here. I appreciate the time, sir. It was a great break from master's degree papers, academy papers, uh, APA seven till you die out here. It's it's a, it's, it's a rough life, but again, I don't get to talk to soldiers about, well, this is what you should be doing. If I haven't done it already, when soldiers talk about college, right? That's, that's too, I don't have too, I have too much time. I don't have enough time. Well, are you sure? Because this is, where you can chug, you know, nug out time and be more, you know, be more useful with your time instead of doing the old E4 tropes in the barracks that we all know and love. Oh yeah. So I appreciate you having me on, sir. Um, if anybody needs uh, anything, any questions, any 
I'll throw out transportation questions, right? Just uh, DMs are always open. Uh, by all means, I'm here to help. Appreciate your time, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Have a great weekend. You too.